Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to continue feasting upon your word here. I just ask that you would comfort our hearts during these troubled times. Allow us uh, that bold access that you say that you've given us to approach the throne of grace for help in time of need. I pray for all those that are struggling and hurting, that you would supply their every need. I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts truth, and only truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at BlessedHopeForever.com. It is very cold here in southeastern Oklahoma. So I've spent a lot of time looking at chapter 14, and we're going to talk about that. So let's just jump right into this. Verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I've suggested that I believe that these hundred and forty-four thousand, is that's a literal number, twelve thousand from each tribe. And... Uh, there's no reason to believe that that is symbolic of all of the redeemed, but this is 144,000, and they're scattered around the globe. And they are probably, most likely, in my opinion, uh, they, they came about, that ceiling came about uh, as a result of the witness of the two, the ministry of the two witnesses. And now they're to spread the gospel throughout the world, which they do. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder and i heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty four thousand i think it's safe to assume here that the text is basically telling us that there is it would be impossible for us to learn the song, quote-unquote, of Old Testament saints today during this present age of grace. We don't know what it's like to be an Old Testament saint. Uh, we also don't know what it's like, and we will not know what it's like to be a tribulation saint. I do not believe that these 144,000, that that no man could learn that song but, but the 144,000, I don't believe that they uh, are able to sing the song that we sing. And I believe that's simply all that that's saying. And these were redeemed from the earth, the text says. They are they, uh, these are, are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now you can take that uh, as, as meaning that, you know, they, they never had any relationship with, a, with women, that the, they are a celibate. Uh, and you can look at that in the physical sense. I don't believe that that's what that's saying. I believe it's contrasted with the verse that we're about to read here regarding the uh, Antichrist system. They were not defiled with women. They were, they were not involved in the worship of false gods and in spiritual idolatry, uh, spiritual fornication. They are virgins. They're virgins in the sense that they are uh, espoused to our Lord Jesus Christ. And these are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Wherever he goes, they follow the Lamb. And, of course, we could stop right there and preach a, a, a sermon on, on how that his sheep hear his voice, that we follow our Lord Jesus Christ everywhere he goes. And and not, not only that, but look at who is leading it's not that he follows us, but that we follow him. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men. They were redeemed. They were always redeemed. Christ died in their place. They didn't become redeemed because of any decision that they made. They were redeemed from among men. How? Through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in their place. They were seed that he sowed, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. 
the first fruits. We're looking at the context, folks, is the tribulation period. They are the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb in this period known as Daniel's 70th week. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And folks, you stand, you and I stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. We stand before Him without fault. They don't, they're not standing there without fault before the throne of God, okay, in John's vision, because they were faultless. But because they stand there in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, made the righteousness of God in Christ. They are without blame, without fault, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And that is how we stand before God today. In looking at the three angels in Babylon's fall, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. I've, we, we've seen that angels can represent human messengers. Now, if you want to look at that as an angel, a messenger, a human messenger, a pilot flying a, a Cessna, pulling a banner that, that says you need to accept Christ, you know, um, you know, I guess that's your right. I, I don't think that that's talking about a human messenger. I believe that we're looking at a literal angel flying in the midst of heaven. There's no other reason to believe any, anything different than what it's saying here. And it's the everlasting gospel. Now, I've often mentioned how that the, the, in the context that we're looking in, in, in which we are at right now, we're looking at not the gospel of grace that we today believe in, or that which was given to the church, that is specifically given to the church. We're looking at the gospel of the kingdom, the same gospel that John the Baptist preached in which Israel, God's people, rejected. They rejected that gospel. They rejected his king. It is the gospel of the kingdom. It's the only good news that could be preached. But the text is saying that it is the everlasting gospel, the perpetual, unending good news. It, the word is good news in the Greek. And that's, that should be paused for consideration because it doesn't matter whether it's the church age, the Old Testament period, the church age, the tribulation period, or even the 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 need for salvation during the thousand years okay in which it all looks back will look back to calvary okay uh, people in the millennial age folks will will live and die generations will come and go they will need to be saved okay uh this is an everlasting gospel a perpetual gospel it's unending good news from, the, from eight, the ages to the ages. So this angel flies in the midst of heaven, having this, this gospel to preach unto them that the, the earth dwellers, those that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, none excluded. The message will go out to the entire world, saying with a loud voice, fear God, reverence God, and give not be afraid of him like you would uh, some rhinoceros charging at you, but fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him, okay, that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It's easy to read that and say, well, these are the individuals in this period. Now, they, they're forced to make a decision. You know, judgments come. They, they've got to worship him. And if, the, if so, they'll be redeemed. And that is not what the text is saying. Okay? What the text is saying, clearly saying, it, if you combine all of Scripture and bring all of Scripture to bear on this, because Scripture interprets Scripture, there, there is judgment for the wicked, redemption for the elect. Judgment for the non-elect. Okay? Their judgment has come. Those who have made the earth their permanent abode, but those who belong to Christ, 
will worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The time has come. And there followed another angel. Another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Twice. Twice he mentions it. He could have said it just once. And, of course, we, we tend to skip over that. We, can't, we, we tend to read, blow by that so quickly that we don't stop and pause and take notice of the fact that he repeats himself. Is fallen, is fallen. He doesn't say Babylon is fallen. He says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There's a, there's a great exuberation, a great excitement over the fact, a great emphasis on the fact. God wants to emphasize the fact that Babylon is fallen. That great city. And we're going to talk about that city in this video. I hope to be able to give you my position on that. And uh, if you choose to disagree, that's fine. There are many various interpretations on that. Because, and here's why, because she, she, and the reason that she fell, okay, it's because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's in contrast to what we just read in verse 4, okay? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, okay? These nations, they drank of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, all right? And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and I talked a little bit about this in a previous video, and receive his mark in his forehead, well, that's in contrast to those who have God's mark in their foreheads. And that's, that's interesting. I, I could spend some time talking about that. You could probably ask the question, um, who's copying who here? Is God copying... Uh, the uh, the Antichrist by marking his people, okay? Or is the Antichrist copying God by demanding that those who, uh, the, by demanding that they receive a, a mark in their forehead? And, you know, so it's the very fact that you have two marks in, in, in forehead, you have two entirely separate different marks in foreheads of two entirely different sets of people is interesting. And that, that could be talked about. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. The word in the Greek there is, is undiluted. Okay? Undiluted into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. And I don't believe that that means that God and, and the angels are going to stand there for all eternity gawking or, or, you know, at these individuals. I believe that the phrase in the presence of is a very uh, interesting, it's a very interesting phrase in my opinion. It I believe that it, what it denotes is, is the fact that they are there. They know that they, they deserve to be there. That their, their torment before God in the presence of the Lamb and, and, in, the, and in the presence of the holy angels is just and it's deserved. They have the, the smoke of their torment ascends up. Same word for Christ ascending. It ascends up forever and ever. And I believe that means forever and ever. I do not believe that what uh, many have suggested, well, forever doesn't really mean forever. Or eternity doesn't really mean eternity. Everlast, ev everlasting life is, doesn't mean, you know, eternal life doesn't really mean eternal life. I don't see how that we can take it any different. And, of course, man has always had a problem with that. The reason why that there are so many... Uh, different ideas as to, as to try to explain the, the idea, just how could God possibly uh, allow someone to suffer forever in the lake of fire? I mean, when you contrast that with the same, uh, with the opposite uh, side of the coin, so to speak, where that we live and reign and, and, and worship God throughout all eternity, not just for a specific period of time, but forever, then it, it would make no it wouldn't be consistent to say that these individuals do not suffer judgment for eternity. 
There is no rest for these individuals, not day nor night. The, the serious, it's the seriousness of sin, folks, that we really don't really, honestly, none of us have really taken and really considered the seriousness of sin. It took our Redeemer becoming man, leaving the glories of heaven, becoming incarnate in human flesh, dying in our place, the very uh, the holiness of God, becoming sin for us. I mean, uh, it's there are almost, I don't think that anyone has ever been full, fully, has fully been 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 able to put into words the just the seriousness of sin and what and how that that separates us from God they have no tranquility these are those who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep that is guard that's not law keeping. That's guarding. Like a, the word is used, it's tereo. It means a, a prison guard, like a prison guard. They guard the commandments of God and of the faith of Jesus. Uh, you and I, folks, we guard. We cannot help but guard, keep his commandments. Don't let any any Christian out there fool you, trick you, deceive you into believing that keeping God's commandments is living according to the law. That's not the case with us. That's not the case with these individuals. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, what about those who died before that? Uh, from, from since... Henceforth, consider what the text is saying here. Right, okay, the voice says from heaven. Right. Blessed are the day are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, when was it written? Okay. So it's it's saying that from since these words were told to be written, okay, they're blessed. Yea, saith the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, that they may rest from their labors. It's interesting that, well, there, we are actually, and I've, and people have, have pointed out the fact that I often will sign my correspondence resting in him, or I'll encourage others to rest in him. What am I saying when I say that? I'm talking about resting in the perfect finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. We can rest today in Him. Just a casual reading of, of the book of Hebrews will show you that, that there is a rest for the people of God, that we can enter into that rest. Even now, we can enter into that rest. And I find it interesting that that is spoken of as the present, okay? Uh, but... It, the text says that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So we're looking at tranquility. These, those who are not his don't have that tranquility. We do. They, they won't know peace. They'll never know peace. We can know that peace even now. And now we're looking at the harvest of the earth. And, and the lot could be said about the parable of the sower. You can't, it's, it's impossible to talk about a harvest without talking about a seeding or a sowing of seed. The text goes on and says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And I think we can all agree, that's our Lord. Uh, just think back, look back uh, throughout all of Scripture. And how the word cloud is used in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. He had a, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple. 
crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. That's, that's interesting. Crying out to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. Reap. It's interesting that we have an, an angel that is, I believe, that is crying out to our Lord that the time has come to reap. It's not the other way around. And that's interesting. You might want to spend some time thinking about that. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. Okay? For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Okay? The time, the, the harvest of the earth is ripe. You could stop right there and we could spend time talking about, folks, we could spend time talking, just stop there and spend time talking about how that that everything happens according to God's timing. Okay? Uh, the harvest is not going to occur until the earth is ripe. Uh, the, the, but we, the same principle is, is true as it concerns your day-to-day -day life. And Everything that we go through, it's, it's not just the fact that these things happen. It's when they happen is, the, is what I'm trying to get at here. You know, the time will come for the time, you know, the time will come when you will have to suffer some catastrophe, some trial, some hardship, some grievous circumstance in your life. And it's perfectly timed by God. So <clears throat> he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. God's people, the seed that he sowed. You're looking at Christ reaping the harvest of what he sowed. Okay? In verse 17, another angel came out of the temple. Now we have another angel, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And uh, it's interesting here that, you know, the... You don't see the just one sickle, okay? I want you. I want you to take note of the fact that we're not just looking at one angel, one sickle, one harvest, or or one, you know, uh, gathering. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. That's fire represents judgment. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now we're looking at the, ga the, the, the uh, gathering. The words uh, is gather. Okay. We're looking at grapes of wrath again we see god is patient and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of god the imagery is i guess the word i would use is it's beyond horrific it's ghastly okay uh and the wine press was trodden without the city outside the city. And blood came out of the wine press, even under the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. I'll 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 try to uh, uh, give you my opinion on that. What I think that's talking about as well. Now, looking back, if we look back, the uh, previous chapter, the the beast that rises up out of the sea. Uh, the beast that rises up out of the earth, and the mark of the beast. That's that's what we looked at in chapter 13. And I gave you my position on that, and I, I got a little little feedback. It wasn't too negative. I got some feedback that was really positive. I got some feedback that was not so positive uh, on that. Uh, it is difficult for me, I'll say this again, to talk about this without talking about without talking about Islam. Uh, I hope to, to, that by the end of this video, and I, and I did get some good feedback that from people. Uh, one person emailed me and said that they had really, uh, this had 
I the last video had really got him to thinking about in a new direction about the possibility of Islam being the Antichrist system, whereas they hadn't thought of that before. Uh, I think that by the end of this video, you, you you may even see more clarity brought to the subject of that. I'm hoping that that's the case. Uh, so looking back, uh, we see the two beasts, one out of the rising up out of the sea, the other out of the earth, and we see the mark of the beast. In Revelation uh, uh, chapter 14 here, uh, we see the lamb uh, that's seen on Zion with 144,000 in their song. We see an angel preaches the gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel, which includes, uh, at this particular time, a message of judgment, uh, approaching judgment or imminent judgment. We see uh, another proclaims the fall of Babylon, okay? And I do not believe that's talking about the Antichrist or the false prophet. Babylon is a city. The text makes it clear it's a city. It is associated with the Antichrist system and the false prophet. But I want to emphasize the fact that Babylon is a city. And then another warns of punishment for those who worship the beast. And we'll go on and, and we'll, we'll look at, uh, uh, I'll just basically describe to you folks what I see in chapter 14. So after looking at the harvest of the world, uh, Christ reaping only what he sowed, which that's interesting. He has, uh, the, 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 his sickle is different than the sickle of these other angels. Uh, uh, after looking at the wine press of, of God's wrath, um, uh, Christ, the text makes it clear, Christ does not even gather what he didn't sow. But, but uh, angels do that. Holy angels do that. And uh, blood came out of the wine press, even under the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Um, if you go back to the sixth trumpet, I believe in in chapter nine. Uh, you'll see the horseman there. I believe that's it's related to that. That's what that's my belief. Anyway, uh, if we look ahead here to chapter fifteen, we're looking at the vile judgments, or or the angels are are preparing to pour out the the bold judgments, the vile the vile judgments. This there is no question, but the, the context in which we're at right here is the second half, the great tribulation period, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So the wine press of God's wrath, and the angel gathers. God's, we're talking about God's wrath. Christ doesn't gather what he didn't sow. Even unto the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. That is two hundred Roman miles. Okay? Roman, if you want to look at it, it's Roman miles. It's 183 English miles. It's probably a reference to Revelation 19, okay, where uh, in Revelation 19, we see that Christ is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, that is you and me, returning with Christ, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs may be referring to the measure of the land of Israel. Some have suggested that. Since the Jews make it uh, to be the square of 400 uh, parso, um, I, had, I had actually had to Google parso. I didn't know what parso was. I'd never really heard of that before. They often speak of the land of Israel shaking and moving 400 parso, uh, you know, on, on some uh, occasions. A parsa contained four miles. So 400 parso makes 1,600 miles. 
That's the square of four multiplied by the square of 10. And four is symbolic of the created world. Remember back in Revelation chapter four, the four beasts around the throne. Uh, and before the throne, and there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Uh, I believe and I suggested that represented creation, all of creation. So we've got all of creation and then 10 representing completeness. You can look at it that way. That's completeness as it regards the created world. Therefore, indicating no one will be able to escape this judgment. That's pretty much my position on that. That's how I'm looking at it. What it but whatever it means, it is a, a ghastly scene. I just, I just believe that the, uh, the reference to horses, the blood and the bridles of the horses, I believe is a reference to the, our returning with Christ at the second coming. Uh, in fact, Christ is seen coming uh, out of Jordan with his uh, garments drenched in blood because he defeats the armies of the Antichrist. Now here's where <clears throat> it gets a little controversial. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> we're talking about the great harlot, the mother of harlots. That's the mother of harlots, plural. She has daughters, folks. Okay. She's got daughters. In uh, chapter eleven, uh, there, you know, we, we looked, we read where uh, there, the two witnesses, their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Okay, figuratively, we know it's Jerusalem, but figuratively, Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Jerusalem, just before Christ comes, is viewed by God as pagan Egypt. And Sodom, okay? And so are her daughters born of her. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, plural, okay? And abominations of the earth. Uh, We've got to go back to the Old Testament here, folks. Uh, the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt, the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst, says Isaiah in chapter 19. What, is, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes, most of you are familiar with that. History, folks, repeats itself. Babylon, ancient Egypt, Sodom, they all repeat. Revelation chapter again, the, the literal Jerusalem is called Sodom. The mother of harlots is, is plural, collectively. Okay, it rules over all the kings of the earth. Kings, as in her daughters. Okay, John says that this harlot Babylon has daughters okay ezekiel 16 we read however i will restore the fortunes of sodom and her daughters the mother of harlots is a city okay the daughters plural are other peoples other nations yet it's it's a it's a corporate entity but it is born of this one mother. One mother. Go to Psalms 46. You'll read, Though their waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake in their surge. This is speaking of this harlot's daughters. The mountains quake in the surge. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, says Revelation chapter 17. All right? Hate jumping ahead, but that's, that's what we see in, in chapter 17. 
How could nations here constitute a single city when the harlot is composed of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues? That is, and we're talking about that's destroyed by the Antichrist who made the world a wilderness and destroyed its cities. The prophet Zechariah warned, leave these lofty mountains which are towards the north when he, when he says, when he, he states, come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven. Come, Zion, escape you who live in daughter Babylon. Ezekiel 2.7, this north is but one daughter out of several daughters that constitutes this mystery Babylon. Now, folks, I know that that many there are many that watch this video, and they probably click off of it uh, in no time at all because they don't want to even entertain the idea that the second largest religion on the planet has anything to do with the Antichrist system, which le really leaves me scratching my head. But that's their choice, okay? When we bring the Old Testament verses into carry them over through the New Testament into the book of Revelation. And this is just my opinion for what it's worth. We can't help but see that that's, that's what we're looking at. And so I'll, I'll go on. I'll, I'll try to explain this in a little uh, better way. I hope, I hope I can. This, a video like what I'm doing here, folks, right here requires really a seminar, not just a 30-minute 45 minute video but I'm going to try to to get to the, the to my main point of this video here you see the northern hemisphere is included okay uh, so is the west so is the Middle East that uh, gosh I, it's without without going through it spending hours in a talk in a giving a geographical presentation of all this maps geographical locations all of this folks is extremely important in understanding this we can't do it apart from that revelation chapter 16 speaks of the cities of the nations ruled by great babylon and Jerusalem's got to be included, okay? Which is why the city of our Lord's crucifixion is called Sodom and Egypt. It's part of this harlot enterprise in our present context. Therefore, Islam and Arabia must also be included. God is bringing his wrath on the peoples of all false religions, all of the earth dwellers, those who have made the earth their permanent abode, those who are not his people, not his elect, not seed he sowed, peoples of all false religions, but including Islam, saving only a converted remnant who are his people. That's what we're looking at. And in the 17th chapter of Revelation, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay, so it is an entire system that in incorporates or encompasses all of that. And he says unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now, in in, chapter, in verse 8, where it says, uh, another angel says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her, of her fornication. Let's, let's, let's try to identify Babylon here. All right. Now, many, many Christians, many scholars insist, and they have for the longest time, they insist, well, this has got to be Rome. All right. You know, in adhering to a centuries-old theory initiated by Martin Luther. It, folks, it is not wrong. I will say dogmatically, this is not wrong. Others say it's Iraq. Well, you know, and especially with, since, you know, in, 
back in the early Gulf War, they thought, you know, and Saddam Hussein, you know, who was all he was trying to do was, you know, was was reconstruct a, you know, rebuild a Baghdad, you know, as a tourist attraction. Baghdad's uh, Saddam is dead now. It's not talking about Iraq. You know, they say, well, it's got to be, it had to, surely that's origin, that's Babylon, because it was the original Babylon, folks, it is not Iraq. I'll give you an important clue. As I speak, and this has been actually been going on for quite some time, but Iranian missile launch sites are aimed at, are aimed in the direction of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Iran, which is biblical, biblical Elam, according to the Bible, according to your Bible, this is an undisputed fact in the end times, at some point, Iran must, that's Iran, biblical Elam, must destroy Arabia. Must. It has to. God said that would be the case. All right. And right now, today, Iran has missiles pointed at Saudi Arabia. It was the prophet Isaiah in the 21st chapter that he, he leveled a prophetic uh, word against Babylon. Uh, Behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and he said, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and all the graven images of her God he hath broken unto the ground. And in Revelation chapter 18, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power in the earth, was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong, strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. We have... Uh, the burden against Duma in Isaiah, the burden against Arabia in Isaiah, all the glory of Kedar will fail, says Isaiah. Okay? Duma, Duma Arabia, Kedar. Okay? These are all verses. I, I, you can't make this up. These are all in Arabia, which is destroyed by Iran, Biblical Elam. And Duma, by the way, was one of the sons of Ishmael. Uh, it's believed by many that Kedar, Ishmael's son, is the line from which Muhammad descended. Folks, this has got any, anything but Rome written all over it. Okay? Or, or America, or or the or Euro the European Union, or United Nations, or anything like that, folks. I, I wish I knew how to emphasize strong enough the fact that we're not. We're, this is all Middle Eastern centric. Okay, it's not European centric. Uh, Isaiah chapter twenty one: A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously. And the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam. Okay? Besiege, O media. All the sign thereof have I made to cease. Dearly beloved, Iran destroys Mecca. Mecca lies in a desert valley in western Saudi Arabia. It is Islam's holiest city. It's the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad and the religion of Islam itself. Only Muslims are allowed in the city. You can't go there. If you tried to, you'd be killed. Millions of Muslims go there every year for, this, for their annual pilgrimage. There's a sacred mosque, sacred quote-unquote mosque, that surrounds the Kaaba, the Kaaba, which is a black cloth-covered cubic structure. Many of you have seen it. You know what I'm talking about. It is Islam's most sacred shrine. When it comes to the harlot woman, 
The Kaaba is a perfect match. The black tarp is considered by most Muslims to be a woman's dress. Kizwa. It's even written on top of the black tarp that this covering is her dress. The way that God describes the harlot is itself, it fits the, the, the Kaaba. Dress, pearls, jewels, gold, silver, even the blasphemies that are etched in silver threads with golden inlays across this, this tarp. The doors of that Kaaba, uh, just the doors alone, has 280 kilograms of pure gold. We read in Revelation chapter 17, the woman, the whore, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. This The Kaaba has a scarlet colored inner garment. The part of the cover covering the door is, is called a burqa, just like the veil that Arabic women wear. They even compare the Kaaba to a virgin adorned with her finest wedding dress. Muslims today, they kiss, they caress the black rock. When Muslims read Isaiah 21, they're reminded of the story of Muhammad when the Muslims immigrated from Mecca to Medina. But this gets more interesting. All Arabia, including the glory of Qadar, Mecca, will be destroyed. How do we know this? God says no Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. Now I'll leave it to your imagination just what causes this destruction. We are not looking at Rome. We're not looking at the European Union. We're not looking at the United Nations. We're not looking at America, Washington, D.C. I better not say anything else about that. Arabs pitched tents in Arabia, not Rome. The fulfillment of this verse is the destruction of the last days Babylon. The passage speaks about the day of the Lord and the heavens not giving light. This is not historical, okay? It's not historical, but end times related. Folks, we must use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Okay, not just read through passages of Revelation and draw conclusions based on guesswork and feelings, you know, or hearsay. We've got, we have been given, we've been gifted, we've been handed the tools, amazing tools, the technology, uh, to pull all this together today, folks, at this particular time point in history to see just what's going on. Then we have the Red Sea. The earth is moved at the noise of their fall, at the cry, the noise thereof was heard in the Red Sea, Jeremiah 49. The Red Sea is a geographic, it's a geographical dead giveaway, folks, as to where the last days of Babylon will be located. Look at Mecca on any map, you'll see that it sits near the Red Sea. This is not speaking about Edom, modern-day Jordan. Okay? Edom stretches from Yemen to Saudi Arabia. Greater Edom included all of the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. I want you to notice the description of her destruction. Okay? As Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown along with their neighboring towns, says the Lord, so no one will live there, no man will dwell in it. it it's no surprise that Iran is, is trying to get nuclear weapons. It's no surprise that Iran is focused on Saudi Arabia since the Bible predicted that the harlot is destroyed by the beast that she rides, that is, the nations that she deceived with her spiritual harlotry. And Iran today views Saudi Arabia as, what, a friend? No. They view it as worldly Islam. There are, we have Christians, dearly beloved, we as Christians, within Christianity, we have different divisions, we have different denominations, different sects. We, we see other denominations, well, they're worldly. 
okay? This sect, they're worldly. We're spiritual, they're worldly. You know, they're carnal. We're, you know, we, we do that. Iran today views Saudi Arabia as worldly Islam, okay? I think this video that I want you to watch here will explain this a whole lot better than I can. Let's just say straight off that if Iran and Saudi Arabia were to go to war, that would be catastrophic. No one really thinks that's going to happen. But they are definitely at loggerheads, facing off and even fighting by proxy all over the region. It's about a struggle for power that's been going on for almost 40 years. Saudi Arabia, home to Islam's two holiest sites, always felt it was the undisputed leader of the Muslim world. But then, in 1979, along came Ayatollah Khomeini and Iran's Islamic revolution. He was welcomed by the biggest crowd in human history. Suddenly, Saudi Arabia had a rival. Fast forward to today, and Tehran's influence extends across a broad area of the Middle East, from Iran in the east to Lebanon in the west. Saudi Arabia feels threatened in its own backyard. And then, of course, there's religion, the two countries representing the two rival camps within Islam. Saudi Arabia is Sunni. Iran is Shiite. So this geopolitical rivalry inevitably has religious overtones. In Yemen, there's a civil war. Saudi Arabia is helping one side, Iran the other. In Syria, Iran supports President Assad and has sent troops and militias to fight for him. The Saudis have funded and armed rebel groups. In Iraq, since the fall of Saddam Hussein, Iran has become hugely influential. Recently, Saudi Arabia has been trying to extend its influence there. And then there's Lebanon, a complicated country with its own delicate power balance. For decades, Iran has supported the Shiite militia and political party Hezbollah. It's part of the Lebanese government, but it's also fighting in Syria and has a presence in Yemen and Iraq. For Saudi Arabia, this is all too much. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, who pretty much runs the country, has been sounding increasingly tough on Iran, accusing it of trying to dominate the Muslim world. Most people think the crown prince actually ordered the recent resignation of the prime minister of Lebanon. The prime minister, Saad Hariri, made his shock announcement in Saudi Arabia. I want to say to Iran and its followers that they are losing in their interference in the affairs of the Arab world. The suspicion is that Saudi Arabia is trying to force a confrontation with Hezbollah to weaken its authority and the influence of Iran. If so, this is dangerous territory. It could open up a whole new front in this cold war between Saudi Arabia and Iran in a country, Lebanon, that has already seen far too much conflict. Folks, Revelation chapter 17 proves it is not Rome. Here is the mind which has wisdom. I mean, think where we get wisdom. I've, I've suggested it's through the study of this book. And remember, John is writing this in about 95 AD. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Look at the chart I want to put up on the screen here. Five are fallen. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon. Medo-Persia, Greece. And one is, okay, that would be Rome at the time John's writing. Rome at the time John's writing. And the other, okay, the Turkish Ottoman Empire is not yet come. Well, at the time that this was of the writing, it had not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. It did until its defeat in, in, in 1923 when Great Britain, during the First World War, brought it to its end. Okay? The Ottoman Empire. These will be part of the revived Ottoman Empire, the deadly wound that is healed. We're looking at the great harlot along with her daughters. Rome doesn't have seven heads. It doesn't have seven mountains. It doesn't have seven kings. 
And as far as a daughter of the harlot is concerned, it is but one of the great harlot's daughters in the last days. And the ten horns which thou sawest, or ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, because this is you know, yet future, but receive power as kings one hour, one hour with the beast. One hour. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The word hour in the Greek there, it figuratively, it means a, a particular season, a limited time. Okay, uh, a, a divinely preset time period, a limited period to accomplish God's purpose. That's what the word means, the hour. Okay, a limited time. Folks, we're going fast forward, I mean, f from the sign, you know, to, to here, 2021. We're in 2021. In 2021 is rolling we're rolling through 2021 like a snowball downhill at the present time there are roughly 2.3 billion or or 31 percent uh of the world uh, the people the population of the world are identified as christians nearly Two billion, a little less than two billion Muslims. Twenty four point nine percent is what they say. Call it rounded off, say twenty five percent Muslim. So in comparison, we're looking at thirty one percent Christian, twenty five percent Muslim. All right, so well over 50% of, of people around the world have a, adhered to these two religions. Now, I want you to imagine what would happen if today we were suddenly gone. We disappeared. Stop and think about it. You cannot have Turkey as the second largest army and you cannot have Islam as the second largest religion and and talk to me about the tribulation period and even mention the tribulation period the day of God's wrath and judgment and without bringing the subject of Islam into the picture. I was sitting around the other day and I was thinking how ridiculous that, that it would be to even suggest to a Muslim during the tribulation period that he had to receive some mark on his forehead uh, because if he didn't, that that he was going, his head was going to be cut off by some other entity, you, uh, some other system. Uh, I mean, you fill in the blank. Folks, it's just ridiculous. Well, listen, I'm way over time with this video, but I hope that it helps, uh, at least gives you something to think about as usual. I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. Um, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you're staying warm. You're staying safe. I want to thank you for all of your support and all of your messages and kind messages of encouragement. I want to thank you for your prayers, for the direction of this ministry, as well as my health. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.